There we go. All right, everyone, we are now live on YouTube. Here we go. That will pop a little away in a moment. So, hello. Thank you so much for being here. Let me make sure I stand under the microphone so our friends online can hear us. If anyone is having trouble, could you please comment in the chat immediately? Hopefully, you can all hear us. Um, I want to introduce you to our compost workshop today. I'm still not sure why that is on the screen because it's not on my screen, but it'll probably go off soon. Um, my name is Katie McCain. I'm the Director of Sustainability at the City of Charleston, and I have a whole team of wonderful people here with me today that can help answer all your questions. Of course, it's not working. Okay, there we go. Um, Jeremy, how do I switch this? Give me one second, please. I don't know why that is still up there. You click, got it? Yep. <laughs> I did. Sorry. Hey, can you try the X? Can you try the X? That pop up is not on my screen. Let me oh. just try resharing. Okay. That is still not working. I know. I wonder if it's on this computer over here. Hold on. Give me one second. Got it. Sean, that worked. Hey, crisis averted. You remember, you remember the text? <laughs> Okay, I haven't seen any comments online. Chat is disabled. Okay, thank you. Um, but it sounds like you can hear us, Rick, right? Um, okay, moving then. So, let's start over then. Uh, so, uh, uh, my name is Katie McCain. I've got a whole great team of people today, and I want to just uh, take a moment and introduce them. Uh, first, uh, just take note we are on a webinar, so this is a hybrid meeting. It will be recorded and posted on YouTube. I'd encourage us, uh, folks online to utilize our webinar tools. So there is a Q&A tool. If you have a question throughout any time in this session, feel free to pop it in there. We will get to those at the end of the session. Um, there is not a chat box, so please do not try to put a comment in there. You can also raise your hand online, and if you would like to speak at the end, we can unmute you and you can ask your question that way too. So. Those questions will happen at the end for anyone online. Okay, so the team here with me today. So this is a group effort. This is now a regional program. It started as a city program, and I'm super excited to share that we have cross jurisdictions. We are all working together to make a bigger impact, and that means I've got a great team. So uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Smart Recycling, uh, Megan is here with Smart. So Smart Recycling is our contracted hauler. They're the ones that actually take the food scraps to the compost facility in their vehicles. Um, then of course we have uh, Betsy with the Coastal Conservation League and she's here to talk about home food scrap composting. Um, and then we also have other partners you can see on here and there's other cities involved. Uh, Aspen over here is our sustainability intern. And Stuart in the back corner is also a volunteer and helps and participates on the Resilience and Sustainability Advisory Committee. And perfect timing, Mayor Tecklenburg is here. Uh, we have a special special week, right? Earth Day is April 22nd, so I would like to turn it over to Mayor Tecklenburg and say a couple words and introduce us. Thank you, Katie. Hey, everybody, welcome. Hi. You can get your own composting bin to take home and use, like. Sandy and I do. And, um, but there are some things I like to put out in the yard, like my coffee grinds. So I'm a little discriminating about my composting. 
some things I like to keep uh, on the site and some things I like to um, send, send uh, to the bin that we have over at Ackerman Park. And Katie's got even more places now, I think, uh, lined up to, to have drop-off places, right? So um, I bet this is really the choir right here. And, you know, y'all know all about this stuff. But, um, you know, the, the thing about it is that that um, when garbage, you know, food waste goes to a landfill and it gets covered up, then it's not um, um, decomposing with oxygen. Believe it or not, I'm a chemistry major and learned about oxidation, but, you know, every a lot of folks know about oxidation. It's a very simple um, uh, chemical um, reaction. So you deny the oxygen, and you get end up getting methane rather than carbon dioxide. And of course, the carbon dioxide isn't great. We got too much carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. But methane is actually worse as a, a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide is, and um, uh, something like. Almost 20% of the methane produced in the United States comes from landfills, from people sending their garbage to the landfill, and it doesn't uh, oxidize with oxygen. So it seems like one of those little things that, that gee, how could this be making a difference? But, uh, you know, if, if we all uh, spread the word and, and, um, and, and do our part, I think it really can make a difference. And uh, I'm a little older than most folks here, um, and I remember from the 60s, that old saying that um, think globally, but act locally. And this is a way we can act locally, of doing something at home uh, that people can do on an everyday basis that makes a difference in, in the global equation of, uh, of climate change we're seeing on our planet. Um, you know, uh, Charleston, uh, thankfully, with Katie and Stuart's efforts and, and uh, a great number of volunteers was the first city in, in our state to have a climate action plan. And this is just a little part of that, but it all adds up. And one of the favorite um, sheets I have in our climate action plan is that last page where we go through all these little things that, have you thought about composting? Thought about turning out lights? You know, thought about those Little, little things that we can do locally that at, at the end of the day, collectively can make a difference, um, you know, in impacting climate change, uh, which I think is an um, a existential issue, not just for coastal cities like Charleston, the sea level rise, but, but really for our long-term um, survival and, and success as, as a human species. So um, anyway, that's my, that's my pitch and I'm sticking with it. I appreciate y'all being here and uh, being a part of the solution and being part of the effort. And thanks to Katie and our team who, who does so much to put these things together. And they really don't cost a whole lot of money, even at the city level or amongst us personally. But I, I do believe, as I said, collectively, uh, we and all, all these things make a difference. So thank you for being part of it. Mayor Tackenberg has actually used compost in his yard and seen a dramatic increase or decrease in flooding, right? Yes, yeah, so um, we did a we had a weed filled lawn years ago and decided to convert it to just a, a great variety of plants, many of which um, were were selected because of their ability to absorb water and, uh, and in effect um, built a little perimeter around the, the, the um, uh, barrier or perimeter around our property to where uh, we try to capture all the water that falls on our property so it doesn't uh, add to the big puddle next door on the sidewalk. Um, uh, they, no houses in my neighborhood were, have, have flooded but we commonly you know it was designed 50 60 years ago there's, there's not good drainage so uh, we get water in the sidewalks and on the streets so I, the way i look at it every drop of water we account for that we can capture and save and utilize and nurture something else uh, the better off we are that's one less drop of water that's got to make its way to the stormwater system and um you know contribute to flooding so um you know the, the coffee grinds help the plants grow, absorb the water, you know, you, you 
follow it on down and, and uh, full cycle. It's, yes. it's the cycle of life, right? Great. Thank, Thank you so you. much. One other partner we have here is uh, Ariel, is the sustainability director over at Charleston County. Uh, she will be talking about uh, why composting is important and what it actually is. So here's our agenda for today. We'll start with Ariel, and then uh, I will talk a little bit about the Food Scrap Drop Site program. And then we'll have Megan from SMART talk about what items are accepted in the program. And then she'll also talk about how commercial composting works, because it works pretty different from backyard composting. What we think you'll find is that you'll choose to do a little bit of backyard and a little bit of the food scrap drop sites, uh, because there's benefits to doing both. And uh, Betsy will finish us up with how we, how we compost in our backyard. Uh, and if you have any, we have all kinds of resources here for you today. You can grab your, your bins. If you are online, we will announce uh, the location and time of where you can go pick up your bins. You'll be eligible for that too. Uh, so we'll give you instructions at the end there. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ariel. So I'm going to talk about how we keep food out of landfills. Um, some of you may or, might, may or may not know this, over 40% of the food that we produce in the United States is not consumed, it just goes to the landfill. So that's a huge number. Um, and considering that 38 million Americans are food insecure, we can see that you know, we're having problems in the system where we're producing so much food and people that are hungry are not getting it. One in nine people in South Carolina are food insecure including over 600,000 children. So this is a huge issue and you know we want to see, of course there's always going to be some level of food waste, but we want to make sure that it can you know, be properly disposed of or used in a better way than disposal. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about prevention. It's really important because the amount of food that ends up in landfills and Wasted food, we also use all these other resources, energy, water, and the production of food. And we think about all the packaging that goes into food when we buy at the grocery. So all these things, it's not just the food that we're producing, but all the things that you know we use to basically get it to the grocery and for us to buy. There's so much that goes into that. So if there's things that, you know, look, this is basically a photo. Um, you know, if your refrigerator looks like this, then maybe we want to think about <laughs> buying just what we need to make sure we're not having food go bad. So that's the main thing is we just want to buy what we need and not have a lot of extra perishable items that are going to go bad and we're just going to be buying them and then throwing them out. A little bit about the food recovery hierarchy. So hopefully you can see this and it's a little small for those in the room. But basically, this is a diagram to show how we should be, uh, I guess, if we have extra food, the best ways to deal with it. And composting is in the orange, it's toward the bottom. So although this workshop is, we're focused on composting, composting is not the thing you want to do first when you have food waste. So the first thing on here is source reduction. We're going to, that's basically, it's really not at an individual level, it's at more of a systemic level, policy level. So it says reduce the volume of surplus food generated. So that's kind of what I was talking about, that we're producing all this food that we're not necessarily eating. So that's you know a larger systemic issue, but just important to mention. The second thing, feed hungry people. So of course, if we have extra food, if we can donate it. That's what we want to do, particularly non-perishable. You know, perishable can be a little trickier. But if we can go to a soup kitchen or a shelter or things like that, we definitely want to do that. You know, if you have a can of food or something box, rather than just going directly to the compost or trash with it, if it's still good. The second thing, so if you're not able to donate it, um, the next the next thing on this hierarchy is feeding animals. So of course, you know, if you have a dog, you probably know this very well. You can divert food scraps to animals that you have if you're not able to donate it to people that are hungry. The next thing before composting is industrial uses, so we can use oil, um, you know, that's how biofuel is produced, we can use our extra oils and things to produce energy, so that's um, very important. And then finally we get to composting, so composting is important, but basically we just want to, you know, be kind of clear with everyone that 
composting isn't the number one thing we want to do when we have leftover food. And then, of course, if none of these options are available, we have the landfill option, which is what we want to avoid if we can and just kind of use it as a last resort. Okay, so composting is a natural process of recycling organic matter. Um, in this case, food scraps uh, turn into soil amendment. And then once we have the food scrap composition, it is compost and we can use it as natural fertilizer. Which, um, so, you know, we're taking our food waste, making it into compost, and then we can use it to grow more food. So it's completing a cycle, which is really important. What are the benefits of composting? So there's lots of environmental benefits. Some have already been mentioned. It helps prevent flooding. You know, the methane that landfills released, uh, we can help prevent the release of methane. Uh, if we're able to use uh, natural fertilizer from compost and we can use fewer chemicals, then that helps plants and animals in the environment because they're less exposed to chemicals. Um, one other thing is I think that it's just really nice individually is that when you basically divert all your food waste to compost and your trash doesn't smell, you're less likely to get bugs and things like that. So that's a really nice advantage. Um, and then, of course, you know, we're reducing the expense of trash because when you're recycling and you're composting, you at that point should have very little trash. So you're not really, you know, you get, oh, I know personally, like, very little trash because of composting, so it's really, really nice. Okay, so we already talked about methane quite a bit. Um, composting food scraps combats climate change by reducing the amount of methane that's released. And, you know, it's important because it's 25 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So it's really important to be able to reduce the methane. Last but not least, so this is a picture of the front of the city's climate action plan, which was passed in 2021, is a, um, was mentioned as the first in the state, so that's really exciting. Um, it's aimed to reduce greenhouse gases, including methane, and composting is an important action to take and is part of the plan. Um, and so we're really excited that you are all here to participate in this action. Going to over. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Ariel. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our food scrap drop-off program. So we started this program actually January 2022 as a pilot. We received some grant funds to test it and we were so successful after piloting it at three initial sites that we uh, we mentioned we made a recommendation to Mayor Tecklenburg and City Council to consider funding this permanently in the budget. And they did that. So in January 2023, we got funding to make this a permanent program. I opened up three new drop sites in the city so we can have a full service program. And we've also added all kinds of regional partners. So we were actually up to 10 drop sites right now. And I'm sure you uh, heard the, the news, Mount Pleasant will be joining and adding three new drop sites on May 1st. So that's pretty mm -hmm. exciting. Um, so this is what one of our drop sites looks like. This is at Corinne Jones Park uh, uh, in Wagner Terrace area. We also have a new drop site we opened on the peninsula at Elliott Borough Park on Lime Street. So those two are available on the peninsula. How many people out here are already composting using the Food Scrap Drop Site program? All right, good number. And how many are composting in their backyards? Nice, okay, great. Uh, here's how it works, here's a list of the 10 sites. We do have a map up on our website, um, but basically you can go to any of these sites. So on your, on your way to the beach on Saturday morning, you can drop it off at Pauly Beach or Isle of Palms if, you, if that's convenient for you. You can drop off anywhere uh, and the, Codes to get in them are all the same, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. This is a this is a free service, so the, the city funds this as a way to reduce our garbage expenses. So participating is really easy. You just collect food scraps in your kitchen uh, using a bin like this uh, that we'll give you today. Uh, this bin this bin will will lock and latch, and uh, 
It can be cleaned really easily with just, you know, mild soap and water or vinegar. Uh, definitely don't put any harsh chemicals in it. The, you can also upcycle a container, so like an old coffee can or uh, an ice cream get a carton, things like that work really well. And basically, uh, you just use you just collect food scraps in your kitchen. So, uh, where you put it in your kitchen is really up to you. It's most convenient. I like to co-locate mine right next to my recycling and my garbage can. So they're all together, so it's not harder to compost. Some people like putting them outside. Uh, sometimes that requires some extra effort and steps. Some people put them under their kitchen sink. So it's really up to you what works for you. Find what works for you and, and just roll with it. Once you have a full bag, then take it to the food scrap drop site. And if you are unable to get to the drop site before your container is full or needing to be emptied, you can use your freezer to temporarily store them. Um, and we'll give you some bin liners today too. It's really easy to just grab that bag and throw it in your freezer uh, for the few days until you can get over to the drop site. So we, uh, we the contract with Smart Recycling who hauls all the material from the drop sites to the Bees Ferry Compost Facility, which is the commercial composting facility in Charleston. And we do that at least twice a week. So on uh, for the larger parts, for the larger areas and the larger sites, we're up to three days a week. So Ackerman is one of our biggest ones, for example, in West Ashley. And we have the West Ashley Farmer's Market there that we started composting. Actually, we're going to start today. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so yeah, we'll, we handle the servicing. So, so if you go to our website, you can see a map of all these drop sites. You can zoom in to see the exact spot because some of these parks are pretty big. So you'll want a little more direction where you're going. You'll see the address, directions, the hours they are open, contact information because uh, different, uh, we are hosting six sites, for example, but the hosts on Folly Beach will host their own site. So if there's a, a challenge with that site, you would reach out to them. And then there's uh, some pictures of what's on there. So all that information is online. As I mentioned, the you can because one of the drop sites is at the West Ashley Farmers Market, which I'm so excited opens today. You can uh, kill two birds with one stone and drop off your food scraps while you go shopping locally. So uh, that's a great option. Uh, and I'm super excited that our, our vendors at both our farmers markets are starting to compost this year. We were out at Marion Square the last two weekends and everyone's all signed up and ready to go. So that's really exciting. Your food scraps, you can either pour them into the bin loosely um, and not use a bin liner or you can use a bin liner. What, whatever you find it works for you. Um, if you use a bin liner, you do need to make sure that it's certified BPI compostable. And Megan's going to talk a little more about that. But basically, there's a really big difference between certified compostable and biodegradable. I could say my computer screen is biodegradable because it will break down in 15,000 years. There's no time limit to that word. Uh, so that certification is very important and Megan will talk more about it. Okay, so this is supposed to make you laugh. <laughs> So one of one of the challenges, yes, all right, we've had some uh, hoorahs. One of the challenges with any compost program is contamination because there's nobody going through it to sort it out. And what happens if we have carts that are contaminated is I need to call my director of environmental service, our garbage guy, if you will, and ask him to go landfill a whole cart. Um, so the the compost facility just won't accept it and SMART won't pick it up if it's contaminated. So we tested this in the pilot. We knew it was going to be a challenge and we overcame this by locking the bins and having everyone sign up. And it's actually worked really well. We haven't landfilled a single cart in the whole uh, during the whole program. So if you're not, that's why they are locked. Um, they're in parks and public places. People walk by walking their dogs all the time. We, we did have them unlocked foot for the first week or two and we saw some dog food bags go in. So, so that's why they're locked. Um, good news is when you actually sign up for the program, so you'll go to the website and you'll fill out a little form and it will actually take you through a little training of what items are accepted. You will all be pros at the end of this workshop and be able to scroll right through it. And then at the end of that sign up process, it will provide you that lock code to unlock the carts. The lock code works. It's the same for every single cart. So uh, make, that makes it easy. I would ask that you please don't share the lock code uh, outside your household. Uh, share this information with your household. If your neighbor wants to sign up, please encourage them to go through the sign up process so they know what items are accepted. 
Uh, and also just a reminder, we call these food scrap carts. Yard waste does not go in here. Yard waste needs to go to the compost facility separate because there is a recipe to make compost. So many parts food waste to so many parts yard waste. The, the greens and the, the browns, if you will, Betsy will talk more about. So it's important to keep them separated. We already in the city collect your yard waste curbside for you. So we make it really easy. So keep your yard waste in your yard waste bags, please. Some information we've had, we had some data. Um, we have a lot of data on the program and you can see there's over 1500 households participating in this program right now, which is pretty exciting. So kudos to everyone who's already enrolled and participating. You can see uh, our three original drop sites have the largest uh, gathering right now as we're trying to reach more people around the new drop sites. And some exciting data. So we are on track this year to divert over 150 tons of uh, from the landfill. So last year we did about 54. So you can see some comparison data from last month. We had our biggest month yet in March when we opened the new drop site. So this is pretty exciting data. We are, we are watching it carefully and um, making sure we use that data to make more informed decisions because that's what the city of Charleston does. Okay, I mentioned this, but uh, remember to use your freezer, especially during the summer months. Uh, great for short-term storage. You know, uh, when you go out of town, you can't you can't get to the drop site right away. Just put it in your freezer and do it when you come back. Um, you do not need to unthaw them when you drop them off. You can just drop them in frozen. We also have a couple resources for you. So during the pilot, this was probably the biggest challenge that came up is uh, fruit flies became an issue for some people. So we put together a resource for y'all and feel free to take it home about how you can prevent fruit flies. They're actually very natural. Fruit flies, eggs come in on your produce from the grocery store all the time. They come in through cracks in your house. They will feed on your compost, but they're not being produced by that compost. So uh, it is important, you know, you can empty the bin more regularly, use your freezer more often, uh, but there are a lot of great tips on that resource if, if that's a concern of yours. But very natural in the low country to have fruit flies about three seasons a year, right? They're already flying up my nose at home. Okay. They like to drink wine. <laughs> yes, that is one of the tips, wine and vinegar. So we have uh, all kinds of free stuff for you here today. Like, a, like I said, we have the kitchen caddies. We have bin liners. So we have a roll of the compostable bin liners. You'll be able to take these home and test them. Um, feel free to sample that. We also have magnets and stickers. So this sticker here, if you take a bin, you're, you're, you're probably, that's all, probably all you need. Uh, but if you'd like a magnet for your fridge, we do have those also. If you have your own kitchen compost caddy and would like to put a sticker on it, that, that's an option for you also. Um, so I'll mention it now and I'll mention it at the end. What will happen for folks who are online, you'll be able to pick up your little grab swag uh, starting tomorrow at the Permit Center, which is right here in this building at 2 George. They are open 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Monday through Friday, and you can do that, start picking it up starting tomorrow morning. Um, starting May 1st, the grab will be open to the whole public, so I encourage you to grab yours before May 1st uh, just to make sure you get one. And just a reminder, here's the website, so you do still need to actually go in and sign up to get that lock. Take maybe one or two questions about the food scrap drop site program. Are there any questions in this room? Yes. I've used those reusable paper composting programs before, and sometimes they like get wet and kind of fall apart. Do you think the liners there, you could actually take them out and put them in the freezer? Again, my ones that I've used with compost now, sometimes with a compost now, they would fall apart as I was pulling them out. So, I, there are some bags that are more durable than others. These are great. I, I do it all the time. Yes, yeah, sometimes if, you, if you're putting lots of liquid in there, it can leak out. I haven't had a problem. But see what works for you. If it doesn't work for you, then you'll have to try it different way. Any other questions about the drop site program? There is one online, Katie, asking, do you envision curbside picking up being available one day? We're going to start with this. <laughs> Okay, let's move on. And Thanks, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> so let's move on.
Megan, I'm going to introduce Megan here with Smart Recycling. She's going to talk more about how that Beesbury compost facility works, the commercial composting, and what items are accepted in this program for composting. Thank you, Katie. So as Katie mentioned, I'm Megan McGill with Smart Recycling. We are the hauler for this program. Um, and no relation, I am uh, not related to the McGill compost facility, just a coincidence, but I'm going to share with you about how this compost is um, handled or this food waste is handled once it reaches the Bees Ferry compost facility here in Charleston. Maybe. Are you pushing the wrong button? They're pushing it that way. Which button is it? Hold on the right. Maybe just get closer to the computer. Everybody <laughs> else is that? It's because so Kaylin touched the computer. That's oh, okay. Okay. It's not your fault. It's, it's just happened the first <laughs> time. Okay, now it should work. Great. Oops. I'll just stay here. Okay. Sorry. It's, it's, not good. it's not your fault. It's just going to work okay. the first time. So, <laughs> um, the composting life cycle. So, we kind of touched on this, but we're going to collect at home and then drop them off at the site nearest you or most convenient to you and then SMART is going to come and service those carts two to three times a week, haul them to the compost facility here locally where it will be processed and turned into compost and then we can complete that cycle by hopefully growing more food with that compost. So how does this composting magic work? The short answer is science. And let me tell you a little bit more about that science. So when this food waste goes to Bees Ferry, they have a special recipe. So they are going to mix that food waste with yard waste, as Katie mentioned. Um, and they've got a recipe of mostly yard waste. You need a lot of yard waste to, to go in with our greens. And um, 10 parts yard waste, one part food waste. And they mix that and they put it in piles called windrows, which you can see pictured here. After that material completes 15 days at 131 degrees Fahrenheit, it's moved into what's called aerated static piles or ASPs to cure for another 30 days. Once all the regulatory requirements have been met, those cured materials are removed from the ASP batches and they're screened for sale. So if you're dying to know more about um, how this process works or um, what's going on at our Bees Ferry compost facility, you can um, contact them. And if you also would like to purchase the compost that you've helped create, you have two options. One, you can take a five gallon bucket directly to the compost facility and fill it up for a dollar. Um, I do recommend you call ahead and make sure they have some available, but that's one option. If you need more, if you've got a large project and you want to buy it by the, in bulk, maybe by the yard, you can go to their website, www beesbestcompost.com and put in your zip code and it will show you what retailers are selling your local compost and you can go there to purchase it for your projects. And if you would like to find out more, you can contact Billy Crocker. His information's here um, and he's with McGill Bees Ferry. Let's talk about what items can be accepted in this composting program and what can't. So, Fruits, uh, fruits and vegetables, pretty, uh, you know, self-explanatory there. Anything that could have been grown in a garden can go in your compost bin. Dairy products, that includes cheese, milk, um, yogurt, any of those items. If they've gone bad and you weren't able to consume them, you can put them in your compost uh, also, small amounts of compostable liquids. For example, let's say you cut up a watermelon and, you know, those rinds can go in there, but so can the juice. So once you've cut it up, you've got all that juice on the um, cutting board. If you're not consuming it like me, I like to make it into a drink. But if you don't do that, you can throw it in your compost bed. Maybe you made some chicken soup and, you know, the last of it went bad. That can go in your compost bin as well. Processed food. So, any, anything you can consume, even if it doesn't look like it's natural form of a fruit or a vegetable, let's say, you know, uh, crackers, uh, boxed pizza, any of those things, those are still compostable as well. 
bread, dough, bakery items, pastas, and grains. So that doesn't matter whether it's fresh from the bakery or came out of a box, um, you can compost those as well. Food soiled paper. So this is gonna be like if you've got a paper bag that got you know the grease of, of what you had inside on it or um, you know you dirtied your napkins with your food. So those kinds of items can go in uh, your compost cart uh, and also waxed cardboard boxes is acceptable but keep in mind we don't want to fill up these city carts with a bunch of boxes so any clean cardboard um, paper, clean paper bags all that should be recycled first so it's important to recycle first and then compost if it's been soiled in some way um, coffee grounds and tea filters are great um, as well as the, you know, the container of those coffee grounds and tea filters, um, or tea, tea leaves, sorry. But the one thing to keep in mind is tea bags a lot of times have a staple in them. You want to remove that staple because as you can imagine, when you're gardening later with that compost you picked up, you don't want 20 staples in your, you know, in your garden. So um, eggshells. Eggshells are a great one. That's an item that, although you can put it in your backyard compost as well, um, if you don't want to or, or they're too messy for you, you can put them in this compost for the drop-off program. Cooked meats, fish, bones, and shells. That is one that is okay for the drop site, but Betsy's going to tell you you probably don't want to put that in your backyard compost. Um, and just to reiterate the word cooked, so we don't want to put raw meat in our compost bins. Um, it is not accepted. Raw meat is not accepted at the Bees Ferry compost facility. Um, so cooked meats only. So as Katie mentioned, BPI compostable is a very important thing to look for when you are purchasing your own compostable bags. The ones that we have today for you are in fact um, BPI certified. You can obviously just look at this logo and go purchase more of the same if you'd like. But if you're um, shopping and you want to find liners to continue using at home, please make sure it has this um, certification. This also goes for, um, for example, takeout containers. Some of our restaurants are making an effort to use compostable materials. So you just wanna make sure that it has this. And the reason that this is important is because this means that that specific item has been tested to break down in a commercial facility in 45 days. And as we mentioned, timing is important here. If it's taking more than 45 days, then when they do that screening at the end, it's gonna be getting caught. It's not gonna have broken down into the compost. Not accepted. I mentioned earlier, no raw meat. Um, this is important for a couple reasons. As you might imagine, you don't want raw meat on your countertop for very long, um, even in a container. Um, but same reason that the compost facility doesn't want it. It does require an additional um, additional regulations and certifications for them to accept that. And for many reasons, including the pests that they attract, they have decided that that's um, not something they want to accept there. Um, of course, no plastic items. So remember, compostable bags, but no plastic bags, rubber bands, um, any of items like that. Uh, then we've got no non-food items, wood, metal, glass, ceramics, pet droppings, yard debris. Um, if it's recyclable, that, you know, your plastics, your uh, metal, your aluminum, those things could go in your recycling bin, but they will not break down in a compost cart or in a compost facility for that matter. Um, no fats, oils, grease, or non-compostable liquid. Earlier, I mentioned small amounts of compostable liquid are fine. If you've, for example, sauteed your chicken in your pan, you've got a little bit of oil on that, you know, left in that pan, that's okay. But if you've deep fried your chicken and you've got a whole pot of oil, that's not okay. That will not um, be good for the compost recipe. Um, and then of course, no chemical cleaners. So as Katie mentioned, try and use natural cleaners if you feel the need to clean your uh, compost bin at home. Um, vinegar is a great one, but please stay away from bleaching your compost bin because whatever you put in that bin is going to end up in the final compost and hopefully that's gonna be growing more food for us. So we don't want um, chemicals in that. Um, 
my rule of thumb, did it come from the earth? If it came from the earth, it can return to the earth. And is it edible? If you can eat it, it can also be composted. And um, most importantly, when in doubt, throw it out. We would much rather have a few items end up in the landfill than end up with an entire cart in the landfill because we misunderstood um, the rules of the program. So a few items I wanted to touch on that are might be on or near your food, but shouldn't end up in your compost cart. Um, we already kind of talked about plastic bags. That's probably a pretty obvious one. Um, hopefully you're avoiding these as much as you can anyways, but please don't put them in your compost cart. Those little plastic tabs that are on your bread, you might, they might, you might have a metal one or you might have a plastic one. Um, those can't go in your compost cart. And then a sneaky one is your produce stickers. You might think it's so small, it doesn't matter, but it really does. So those produce stickers have a glue that makes them stick to your produce that um, unfortunately makes it so that they won't break down in the compost. And so um, you'd be surprised that whole banana will be gone and you'll have all the stickers left in the final product. Um, and then, of course, rubber bands. You might have that on your broccoli or um, some other vegetable that you bought um, fresh, but they can't go in your compost bin. And as I mentioned, I'm Megan. Um, we are happy to help if you have any questions. We also service commercial customers in the area. So if you have a favorite restaurant that you currently go to, please let them know that this is an option and that this is important to you that um, they're doing this. So we, we love helping um, businesses in the area start a compost program. Back to Katie. Um, hit one more, sorry. All right. That was not fun. All right, so I'll give it over to Betsy, and she's going to tell you all about composting at home in your backyard. Thanks, Megan. Yeah. Thanks again, everyone, for being here today. My name is Betsy LaForce. I work with the Coastal Conservation League. We're an environmental nonprofit advocacy organization headquartered here in Charleston, founded in 1989. We, and myself specifically in my role, had the honor of serving on the Climate Action Planning Committee. I was on the waste team. And so as Katie mentioned, and you've heard from a lot of the speakers today, composting was identified as a pretty low hanging fruit solution to address a lot of different climate issues. So really happy to have seen that action item get off the ground so quickly, really in less than a year of the plan being passed, which if you're familiar with municipal planning operations at all, you know, that's pretty unheard of. So this was a, team effort and a great success in a lot of ways and we're so happy to be a part of it because it is addressing climate action locally. I wanted to share a little bit of history um, on composting in South Carolina. You heard the mayor mention we were the first city in the state to do the climate action plan. We're also the first city in the state to do this government funded community compost drop site program. So That's also really exciting. Charleston's pretty progressive environmentally in some ways compared to other areas in our state. If we're comparing ourselves to other states, maybe maybe not so much. We have the question about curbside collection. As Katie mentioned, this is a really important place to start. As you've seen with some of the data, it's clear that there's a lot of interest in this program. People are participating very well. We've had no contaminated carts get sent to the landfill. Data like this that it's accumulating is making a really strong case to eventually be able to say, not only does this make sense environmentally, but we're going to be saving a lot of money, therefore we should consider a municipal collection program like we have for recycling, like we have for trash. But we're starting here, we're making really good progress. Um, so how many of you are interested in setting up a backyard pile? Maybe you have a backyard pile, you wanna learn a little bit more about some tips and tricks. Okay, great, many of you. Um, for those of you who are not so much, maybe this will spark your interest. You heard Katie mention a good approach to this that I also do at my, at my home with my backyard pile is doing a little bit of the drop site program, a little bit of the backyard. You heard us run through what can go in, what can go in the bins and what can't, and you might have thought to yourself, okay, I wouldn't want to put that in my backyard pile. So we're going to talk about some of those differences. The key thing I like to really relay in these trainings when it comes to backyard composting is that it's pretty simple. Composting in itself as a process is a simple, natural process. So that to say, you know, try not to get too stressed out. Don't worry about doing something wrong. You know, it's there's really not going to be any serious negative ramifications of doing something wrong. That's how you learn, you know, what to do differently and what to do better. But we're going to give you some tips and tricks 
I also highly recommend picking up, if you want to take a paper copy home with you, this composting at home, st simple steps for starting. For those of you online, or if you'd rather not take paper with you, this is available on the DHEC, Department of Health and Environmental Control website. There's also really great resources for educators for doing compost programs in schools. So I'll be referencing some of the information um, in this uh, presentation and from the take home folder and you can access online as well. If you wanna do a deep dive, we only have a few minutes today together in the room. So we'll cover some of the, the key highlights. So we've heard about the compost recipe. Uh, it's a similar recipe at the big commercial facility as it is in the backyard on a smaller scale. And that's really the key difference between, you know, what can go in the pile when we're thinking about scale and mass. You saw the photos at the commercial facility at East Ferry. It's a huge operation. The piles get really, really hot. They're heavy. There's a lot of cover that's being applied to the food waste. It's breaking down. There's a whole team of people paid to control the environment, test the temperature. So you can do some of that on a smaller scale in your backyard. You can take the temperature of your pile and see if it's reaching that thermophilic around that 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, if you want to, you don't have to. You probably have noticed steam coming off of your pile in the colder months or in the early morning because that material is breaking down. There's microorganisms that are coming in and helping to break the material down and it's generating heat. So what, what material you need for the backyard pile is four simple ingredients, the brown material and the green material, that's the carbon and the nitrogen. The brown material is the dry um, leaves, you know, wood, wood shavings, maybe paper bags that are soiled. If you don't wanna just compost them, you can rip them up into little pieces, throw them over. I have found for the brown material, if y'all live in a residential, you know, neighborhood type setting, you'll see people putting out bagged leaves on the curb. That is a free gift to you to take off their hands. It's going to the commercial facility anyway. I will take those sometimes for my neighbor's yard. If they're standing out there, I'll make a little joke. You know, I've got my wheelbarrow. Uh, that's, they're, they're setting it out to get sent to the facility. You can use them for cover in your own backyard. I don't bag up the leaves in my yard. I, I let them stay as ground cover or I'll rake them under the trees. Um, so for those that do bag and don't want leaves in their yard, you can take those um, from your neighborhood and use in your pile. Also just soil from around where your backyard pile is located. Uh, a shovel has been my greatest tool for the backyard pile, not only for adding material, cutting up the material and turning the material. So the other ingredients are oxygen. We heard Mayor Tecklenburg talking about the methane that's produced as a result of anaerobic decomposition to mitigate that ana those anaerobic conditions, all you need is a little oxygen, and oxygen comes through by way of turning the pile. A lot of people wanna know, well, how many times a week do I need to turn the pile? What type of turning, you know, what angle? This is where I say again, don't get, you know, don't make it too complicated. Just turn the pile a little bit. For me, I turn the pile usually when I put material on the pile, and that for my house is a couple times, three times a week. If you're turning the pile every single day or all throughout the day, then you're not allowing those microorganisms to come in and start doing their work that you can't see. When I'm talking to kids, I refer to it as the FBI, the fungus, the bacteria, and the invertebrates that are hard at work, you know, with their little construction hats on with the worms and everything, doing their job, again, making it simple for you. So you want to allow for those microbial conditions to occur. Um, so you don't want to be turning it constantly is the, is the point there. So oxygen, um, brown, green, and water. We live in the low country, it's very humid here. So I haven't found that I need to add water to my pile. Also, when I'm doing my coffee grounds, maybe there's a little bit of leftover coffee in the bottom, that's moisture. So the pile at my house has stayed nice and moist. I haven't needed to add water. Maybe at your house, it's right more directly in the sun, it's getting dried out. So just keep an eye on the conditions of your pile if it looks really, really dry. Or if you're doing the tumble test, if you were to pick up a handful and kind of squeeze it, if water's coming out, it's too wet. If it's crumbling and turning into dust, it's too dry. You want the, the compost pile to be basically like soil. What is soil like? It's like a little bit, it's a little, there's a little bit of moisture there. It's not necessarily wet, but it's also not dry. Um, so again, I haven't needed to add water, but you know, maybe in the summer, if it's really getting dry, just put the hose on it for a couple seconds and make sure it's moist enough. So brown material, green material, greens are your food waste, um, your coffee grounds, that's nitrogen material. 
eggshells. A lot of what Megan ran through that can go in the commercial facility can go in the backyard pile. She mentioned, you know, Betsy's going to tell you not to do meat, and she's right. Um, that being said, with the caveat that, you know, everything in moderation. So for me, maybe I will do a little bit of cooked meat. I, I try not to waste my food. We heard Ariel encouraging us to limit you know, food waste. But if I do have a few bites of meat left over in a pasta, I will put that in my backyard pile as long as it's covered up. So the ratio here with the recipe, you want more brown material than green material. How much more? The ratio is about three parts brown material to one part green material or food waste. Um, if you're starting your pile, we have some images here of different um, approaches to, okay, that we talked about the recipe. This is an updated, um, I like this PowerPoint. As you can see, there's a lot of different uh, approaches you can take for a backyard pile. You can get pretty fancy with it. You can have a carpenter come and build the three bin system. Ask yourself, you know, what are you wanting to do? Are you wanting to use the finished compost in your garden? If the answer is yes, you might consider that three bin system because you can have one, the first part of the bin that you're filling up with food waste and yard waste. Once it's full, you're letting it cure. You're letting it sort of finish and cook. But then what do you do with more food waste? As you have, if you keep adding to the finished pile, it's always in process, it's always active and you're gonna struggle a little bit more to find that finished compost. I just have one big open pile, sort of like the picture in the bottom left, the messiest looking one. It's also kind of the easiest one. I mainly compost in my backyard for the waste diversion, for climate action, and so I don't have smelly trash. I don't have very much trash. I still, even if we all probably put our food waste together in a community pile, the food waste breaks down so much in the compost process that for me, as a house of one, I still need to supplement and I purchase finished product from the Bees Ferry facility to fill up my raised beds and grow my vegetables. So therefore, my backyard pile, you know, I might get a few scoops here and there to put with my potted plants, but it's not like I'm producing enough soil to have like a small farm in my yard. However, if you are wanting to use that finished product in your garden, think about the active pile, you know, the finished pile that's curing, that's full, and then a fresh pile that you're adding stuff to, a pile that's breaking down and finishing, and then a pile that's finished. That's something to consider. Some people don't want the open air pile. They're afraid that possums are gonna come. Little, you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the possum's probably gonna come through your yard either way. You have your trash can, you know, on the curb, the trash is in the bag that's tied up. There are rodents and there are critters in the environment. Again, the main thing here with pest control is making sure the ratio and the recipe is right so that it's well covered by the carbon material. That's eliminating the odors, it's eliminating pests. I've been composting in my backyard with that open air pile for about five years. I have, I have seen a possum, um, not in my pile, you know, the possums in the, in the neighborhood kind of thing. I haven't had any issues with some sort of rodent or pest infestation because I have a backyard pile that's not covered. If you're still worried about that, that's okay. A lot of people do want that covered pile. So you can get a tumbler. You can purchase uh, this material from Amazon, from Home Depot. You can make your own covered bin with like a root trash can with a snap-on lid, like a 95 gallon. Again, when we're thinking about the recipe, it needs oxygen, right? So you wanna make sure there's contact with the soil on the ground and there's air coming through. So some of the other bins, you can see chicken wire, mesh, there's air coming through. If you're making your own bin, you can take a drill, a drill bit, and just drill holes into a plastic trash can with a snap-on lid that's cylindrical, so then you can turn it on its side. I used to do this when I lived in an apartment. Give it a little kick, turn it around like that. That's how you're um, turning it, and then stand it upright. With the air coming in, it will break down quite a bit. A lot of different ways you can go about this. Like Katie said, find what works for you. Go with the flow. We don't have to overcomplicate it. So depending on how much space you have, if you have a neighbor that's concerned about, you know, if you're composting, different things to take into consideration with the style of your pile. Um, so one of the benefits, of course, to composting in the backyard, like we mentioned, is you have that finished material available for use in your lawn or in your garden. You may still want to supplement with more product from the commercial facility for those annual plantings or soil amendments if you're really getting kind of specific about your gardening techniques if you're growing a lot of plants 
Um, but it is nice to have that finished product available right at home. And you're taking the hauling component out of it, or at least in part, if you're putting some at the commercial facility via the drop sites and you're composting some at home, that's even better for climate action when we're thinking about it holistically because you're reducing emissions that are associated with the hauling aspect that's required from picking up the material, hauling it to the facility, and then you're ordering the compost and it's getting hauled to your location. That's inevitable part of the um, logistics and kind of supply chain with many things um, in our system. But you can, again, take that local action and reduce some of those transportation emissions by composting in your backyard. Um, so just some nice images of what you can do with that finished product. Here in Charleston, we have a lot of great local companies that can build you raised beds. They can help you grow food and get started. And then as you go on composting and gardening at home, you get more and more familiar with the concepts and you can eventually do this all on your own if you're not already. Um, so again, some great resources. If you're online, you can see the images and the website, scdheck.gov slash compost. And there's also the website for the Don't Waste Food South Carolina initiative that Ariel was educating us about. Lots of great resources available for you to use online. We are all available to you as a resource. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, and one other bit I wanted to share about the history Charleston County was the first county in the state to start um, composting food waste. And that was also through a pilot program back in 2011. It wasn't all that long ago. We were so successful. It's a permanent program now. We have the commercial facility. We banned yard waste back in the late 90s. And that's why it's required that they're in a paper bag. They cannot be in plastic. Plastic's not compostable. Um, but our facility has grown. Now McGill Environmental is operating the Bees Ferry facility. It used to be the county that was operating it. So now there's a public-private partnership. They've done a lot of work with the marketing. You can buy that product all throughout the community. You used to have to order it from the facility. Now you can go online and find it in local lawn and garden stores. And there are four commercial facilities composting food waste now across the state. We were the first. Now there's one in Columbia, Horry County in the Myrtle Beach area, and then in the upstate in Greenville. Um, so we're making a lot of good progress and composting is having a bit of a moment in our state. So thank you again for being here and contributing to the solution. And with that, we're available to take any questions you might have. Yeah, let's start in here. Are there any questions in the room? Yes. Are any of the local restaurants participating in something like this? So restaurants can compost. They they uh, contract directly with haulers to move their food scraps. This is a residential program only. So thanks for bringing that up. Yes. What happens to the all the uh, poop in the bag that you collect uh, for your pets and all of that? Because I know that where, where does that go? That unfortunately goes in the trash. Um, so we don't want to compost uh, dog waste or pet waste. Um, any, you can compost manure from an herbivore, so chickens, um, but for dogs and other, you know, uh, manure, that, that goes in the trash. Right, and trash is landfill. Landfill trash, yep. I'm just curious where it goes. Which is another kind of greenwashing you'll see in a lot of people out of the goodness of their hearts wanting to do the right thing or buying the biodegradable poop bags. That's not, if it's not going to a compost facility, but it's in a biodegradable vessel, EPI certified compostable, based on everything we've talked about today, that could actually arguably, arguably be worse for the environment because it's producing that methane when it gets covered up at the landfill, the organic material. So if you're spending extra money on biodegradable poop bags, just use you know, plastic bags from the grocery store or any, you know, any other vessel that you have. I like coffee shops sometimes because they have these like plastic caps as long as it's BPI certified, so you should be able to see that label pretty clearly on the lid or on the side of the cup. Just look for that. Um, and if so, absolutely, you can put that in the in the drop sites. And there are a lot of restaurants using compostable disposables with our new plastic ban. So uh, you can certainly put those into the food scrap drop site. As long as you're certain they are compostable. Yes. I think it, there was a reference to um, wax paper being okay. And I've always been a little confused that I know it's about compost, but talking also about recycling. So if you have a wax covered 
no container, is that, first of all, is that recycled? When is that the most recycled? The wax recoveries, for sure. Let's defer to Ariel first. Ariel's in Charleston County. So from what I know, anything wax covered cannot be recycled. And the reason is like a wax covered cup is now two different pieces of materials. Now you have wax next to paper or wax next to plastic and it can't be separated. So you can't recycle that. Um, a, a wax on a paper cup can can be composted because that wax will break down, right? Yes. Yeah, so um, it's important it's important to make sure that um, it is in fact wax, though. So a lot of like coffee cups, um, you know, it, you might think that it's wax, but it's really some sort of plastic material. Um, one good idea if you're trying to figure out if this take-home container is compostable or this cup's compostable. If you can scrape the wax and it comes off, it's probably real wax. If you scrape the wax and it doesn't move, then it's really some other material that's been made to protect the paper from the heat. Great. And if it is real wax and it's compostable, a lot of times it has that plastic part at the top for the lid that you're screwing on. So I've just cut that out with scissors. And if you're putting it in your backyard pile, you might just want to cut up the container into smaller pieces. The smaller the pieces, the faster it'll decompose in your backyard. Somebody asked online, what about paper plates? Paper plates. So if a paper plate is soiled with food scraps, you can put that in the compost bin. If it has nothing on it, you can recycle that. What about pyramid style tea bags? Is the question plastic being what is the, the um, yeah, depending on what the material is, as long as it's not plastic. Yeah. I think the pyramid ones are plastic. So yes, not much of a teacher. So be careful. So an expert, but. Um, the other, I, I think you already mentioned the little metal thing in the tea bags, right? Okay. One question about surplus food donations. Where in the area can folks or lo locate information to donate surplus food? This person was looking specifically for Daniel Island. Okay, so there's all kinds of. So I mean, if you just have. Uh, non-perishables to donate. There's all kinds of food pantries around the region. Um, the Low Country Food Bank is probably the primary one, and then they disseminate to other folks. Uh, a big part of that food donation piece is more so on the commercial level. So restaurants, you know, if they're making 50 hams and they only sell 45, it's better for them to donate those five hams than to compost them. So it's a little the the um, the Food that's not perishable is a little more uh, geared to the commercial level, you know, events, things like that. You've got all these extra hot dogs after an event. Can you donate those? A little less about your kitchen. The kitchen is a lot more about preventing that, preventing your fridge from looking like you can't eat it all, right? <laughs> preventing that waste to begin with. How about pet food? Can that be composted? Something from online would like to know. I think, you know, read the ingredients. Um, like Megan said, if it comes from the earth, it can go back to the earth. Hopefully your pet's eating food that's coming from the earth. Um, and I think again, with the moderation piece, if it's small quantities, it should be okay. Would you say Megan? Yeah, I would say, uh, I mean, I would hope that if you, you know, something's happened and you're, you have a large amount of do uh, pet food that you're no longer in going to use, Hopefully you're going to find better resources for that to donate it to someone that's in need that has a pet or SPCA that can feed it to pets. But if you have a little dog, maybe they've got the little can of food and they, they are picky and they don't eat the whole thing. Sure, I think small amounts is, is probably safe. And as Betsy said, I hope that your dog or kitty pet is eating something that came from the earth originally. So it's probably safe, but definitely check your ingredients and try to use that food hierarchy to dispose of it in the best way possible if you can. And one more, I think Betsy alluded to it, where can you purchase compost? Yes, so Bees Fairy Compost Facility and Megan mentioned the website, beesbestcompost.com. If you go on that website, you can put in your zip code and there will be a store locator that gives you, you know, which one's the closest to your house and then several options or if you want to go from your office. So there's stores all over the low country, lawn, lawn and garden stores, landscaping suppliers that have that available for purchase, roots and shoots, native plant nursery, 
Or if you want a really big like truckload, that's when you'd want to place the order probably with an all seasons mulch and supply like on John's Island or directly with Bees Ferry McGill. Um, so depending on how much you need, either right there at the facility or at a store, and you can find that on the website. Do you have access to the presentation today? Yes, yeah, so it is streaming on YouTube. So as you can, it will be posted on the, the compost web page, but it will also be on the City of Charleston YouTube page, which fast fact, you can watch a lot of meetings uh, that are really fun and exciting on our YouTube page. Um, there's a lot on there now since we're doing lots of hybrid uh, and webinars. So. Any other questions? Anything else online? So just as a reminder, if you are online, you will pick up your, you can pick up your uh, caddies at the permit center at 2 George Street from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Monday through Friday. And a reminder, start, do, that, do that starting tomorrow. And just a reminder that make sure you pick them up before May 1st, because I can't guarantee that they will be there after that as we'll open those up to the public. Okay, if you have any other questions, just let me know. Thank you for coming, everyone. We appreciate it. Enjoy your day.